something. Good morning, my name is Ricky Burdett, and I'm a professor of architecture and urbanism here at the LSE. Uh, and it's wonderful to see so many of you here uh, in this wonderful space designed by this gentleman, who uh, we will, uh, I will introduce in a moment. Um, as you know, this is the first uh, literary weekend uh, at the LSE, which is really about exploring creative processes in art and in writing, and also celebrating uh, the first year of uh, this building and this new facility um, at the heart of London, at the heart of this campus, but uh, in very uh, many ways making our presence in London um, happily quite different from the way it's been for many, many years. Uh, the idea of having a conversation with uh, uh, my three guests is to take the notion of um, the exploration of uh, creativity to the concept of spaces for thought. Uh, and what I mean by that is to, in a way, expand the exploration to the notion of how spaces and places for, for reflection, for introspection, for uh, reacting between the human mind, the human body, and the spaces around us are actually made, both within buildings and within the public realm. Uh, and to do that, uh, I've invited an artist, um, an architect, and the gentleman on the far left is quite difficult to define as a sociologist, an urbanist, a writer. I mean, it's a bit more difficult to categorize him. But to discuss what this intellectual practice of designing or making spaces for thought are. But very much focusing on the notion of spaces for reflection. Uh, there are a series of questions that I think we will ask and debate amongst ourselves. You know, do we need spaces, physical places, where people come together uh, and engage as we inhabit more and more digital or uh, virtual age. I'm sure that will be part of uh, the discussion that we have. As an architect, I trained as an architect many years ago, I've become increasingly interested between the dynamics of spatial form and physical form. This is what uh, I do at the LSE Center for Cities, at the Urban Age Program, which I set up, in fact, with Richard Sennett now uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, and intentionally, it's interdisciplinary. It's having people who are involved in different practices in shaping the urban environment come together and begin to speculate on what are the impacts on different members, different constituencies of society, and on the individual. And I think today we may go from that more social domain more to uh, an introspective notion of that, what actually happens in the human mind, and as I said before, the human body. And to do that, we have um, three makers, I think I can call all of you uh, makers. Anthony is the most obvious maker, he's a sculptor who studied archaeology, anthropology and history of art and I think that has infected um, and affected his work in a very, very clear way. Through his work he's always explored the body by which he means it very much at an individual and at a collective level, uh, the body as a place of memory and transformation. He's been responsible for the Angel of the North uh, the famous Another Place on the Beach in Crosby. He won the Turner Prize and has exhibited in many places, the Tate, the Whitechapel, and most recently at the Hayward, where his um, exhibition called Blind Light, which maybe many of you saw, uh, not only embedded itself in that extraordinary building and made us re-love it, I have to say. Anthony, very important <laughs> point. Made it. But also, um, you placed a number of of your sculptures around the skyline of London, as many of you may remember, therefore forcing all of us to re-engage actually with the city. Uh, it was such a, it was the most popular exhibition actually ever done at the Hayward, and they had to extend late night opening, uh, and I think that is quite intriguing. He's also worked with uh, a number of uh, architects, including David Chipperfield, um, on a pavilion that he will be talking about in Sweden in a moment. And you cannot have escaped, um, let's call it the excitement, the controversy over the last two days since Anthony launched the project called One and Other for the occupation by 2,400 people, maybe some of you will be there, standing on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square in a few months from now. So Anthony, I think, is incredibly well placed to help us rethink some of these issues of the relationship between um, an individual and the practice of um, occupying a space, both in a building uh, and in a city. Rich, as I said, is difficult to define, but uh, technically he's a professor at, of sociology at NYU and here at the LSE, 
whose work over the years is really about how people can interpret their own experience in contemporary society at many, many levels. Uh, his most recent book, The Craftsman, is a journey into the most basic human impulse that people have to just do a good job for its own sake, not in order to do something else, just for the sheer, in a way, pleasure of doing that, but not just at the level of skilled manual labor, but also at the level of making uh, an excellent and beautiful computer program, or being a good parent, being a good artist, being a good architect. And I think um, much of his thinking about cities, work, labor, how individuals, individuals fit into society intersects with the concerns of actually um, being in a place which allows you to do things. He's actually set up uh, a number of important institutions, perhaps most notably um, with um, Joseph Brodsky and Susan Sontag, the Institute of Humanities in New York, um, 15 or so years ago, and then with me, uh, happily for myself, working on setting up the city's program. And one of the things perhaps we might delve together is what, what are the spaces within institutions of learning uh, like? Which are, the, which are the spaces that actually work from uh, that level of sort of intellectual intimacy? He trained as a musician. He had to, in fact, stop becoming a professional session, uh, uh, celloist because of a problem with his hand, but he still continues to enjoy music and food. He's the food writer for The Spectator. And probably most importantly of all for someone uh, like me is that he's won so many prizes I'm not going to mention them. But yesterday in uh, Germany, sorry, two days ago, he received the Tessenow Prize. Tessenow was one of the great uh, German architects at the beginning of the last century whose interest in craftsmanship in making things uh, uh, so that people could sort of feel at home in many senses. Uh, he was a key figure, and um, they couldn't think of anyone, any good architect good enough to get that prize this year, so they gave it to Richard, <laughs> which I think is quite... <laughs> but I, I think it says a lot Don't about the, 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 inter, in the intersection. <laughs> now, Nevin, I've already alluded to in many ways, his um, CV uh, is this, this building, as many other buildings uh, that his practice at Grimshaw's has been responsible for for over nearly 30 years now, since 1980. Um, the Grimshaw firm set up by Sir Nicholas Grimshaw uh, responsible for the Waterloo International Station, the Eden Centre um, in Cornwall, um, and the new very beautiful station at the heart of Amsterdam just um, inaugurated last year. Uh, and I think as an individual but also as a practice, uh, there's an enormous interest in the relationship between structure, skin, and bone. So the relationship between what supports things and how things are um, experience on the outside, but also on within. And I think, uh, I know in conversations with Nevin over, not only in this project, but others, that his um, interest in the play of light, the play of materials, informs many of his uh, works, including uh, what was done for this, I think, really very, very beautiful building. Beautiful also because for the first time it engages with the city in a very, very different way. So what I'm going to do with these um, three uh, guests is ask them to speak for about 10 minutes each, uh, reflecting on these issues uh, that I've mentioned, um, and then start a conversation between us. We have till 1 o'clock, and um, seeing how things go, um, hopefully the last 20 minutes or so, we might be able to also open up the discussion with you, and I think there's a roving microphone or microphones uh, to do that. But um, I'd like to start by welcoming you all. Thank you for coming. Uh, and Nevin, perhaps you could start by talking a little bit about uh, how you as an architect, um, what are the tools, what are the components of your trade, so to speak, in making spaces for thought? Thank you. Um, actually, I, I wanted to start with something you already touched. Um, last week, at some, uh, some uh, goading from myself, uh, a friend of ours who's actually a, a postgrad student here, I asked her, um, well, no, she, she, she basically said this was possible, and it actually I found it astounding. Maybe it's perfectly normal um, to the academics here. Um, it, it is now possible for an undergraduate student, so long as they're signed up to a you know, top quality university that is, contributes to the right journals, um, to sit and do an entire degree without leaving their computer screen. Um, and so the 21st century library of Babel, you know, this is uh, Georges-Louis Borges' um, you know, library of all possible books, 
the digital library of Babel is well under construction and we need to resp respond to it. I, I, so I, I'm, this is my way into this subject. Um, I th it's one of those, you know, you don't know what you've got till it's gone questions. Uh, why do we need academic buildings? Um, uh, so, so let's start here. We say if um, to negotiate a labyrinth, you need well, the first thing you need is a guide. Now, the sort of guide that comes out of your uh, out of the internet doesn't have any empathy, has no ability to um, uh, respond. You know, as human beings, we have infinite grades of responses to other human beings, and I, you need a human guide. You also need colleagues. Um, you would be pretty lonely sitting there at your, your computer. And so, put the colleagues together with the guides, and you have a community. So the, I would say the primary function of academic buildings in this century is to nurture conviviality among the academic com community. Um, now let's go to, uh, no, I would like to take you to um, an archetype of an academic building. The, um, this, this Christmas, my, my wife was born in Alexandria and we had the benefit of visiting some Coptic monasteries and Coptic monasteries were the earliest Christian monasteries. Um, they're all surrounded by desert. They're, they're, they're defensive institutions because it was pretty dangerous being a Christian in those times. Um, so you, you, you're faced with sheer walls and little holes in them and the community inside. So that means in, in the refectory, in the cloister, in the, in the chapel, that's when the community contemplates itself and the monks tend to, you know, the cellular rooms tend to be on the outside, and because you're always surrounded by nothing, because these places are places far away as they could from anywhere else, the monks contemplate the infinite, and I think that's a very nice metaphor for um, contemplation, um, the, both sides of it. Um, so, uh, uh, back to the, of course, a, a modern university institution is a pretty complicated affair, huge constituency. That's one of the. Um, that's one of the, the trickiest parts of doing university building. You, know, you, have, you have academics, you have, you have students, you have, then you have the whole administrative community, the estates department, and the visiting people. There's a whole gamut of different types of spaces. Our, uh, as an architect, our primary role is to act as mediator in what I believe is called the socio-spatial contract between the users and the providers. And you know, that can be very tricky. Not, it's not always straightforward. It's reconciling money with desire. Um, and th then, of course, there's the, the building contract. That's a, another story again after that. So what, um, what would, how do we start grappling with the central um, requirements of, of, of spaces for reflection? I personally, the older I get, the more I think there's a lot that's hardwired into us through human evolution. And um, so I'd, I'd like to sort of paint a picture. Um, well actually, no, there's, no, the first thing I need to say, the most important requisites for reflection are comfort and security. And so perhaps you can see where I'm going. If you wind the clock back a, a, a million and a half years and picture a group of our ancestors and they're sitting around a, a fire and the fire is in front of a cave, um, so that means that the whole the whole back part of their of, of what they're aware of is, is sort of protected by cliff, and the cave they can retreat into if they're under attack, and they, they can also go in there in the middle of winter and, and, and keep warm. Um, and then in front of them, I mean, the Id ideally they would. Um, I suppose what I'm trying to describe is what would one of our ancestors have. have Thought of as a secure place to be. What's the most secure place to be if you're if, if that's your if, if that's your life? Um, so you're you're raised somewhere. So you can see a long way, preferably downhill, in several different directions. So you can see your enemy coming towards you, and you can also escape. So in several directions. Um, so those are the prosaic elements. But then there are the, maybe the, the more poetic ones. Whenever I need to really sort something out, I just go for a walk. There's something about the sky sound of the sea. If we go back to our friends around the campfire, um, one, you know, one would imagine that one of their vistas down to the bottom of the, of the valley, there's, there's, there's a little babbling stream and there's sunlight you know, reflected in the ripples. 
maybe there's a forest and there's dappled shade as the sunlight comes through it and then all around them there are the infinite varieties of patterns, fractal patterns in nature. These are the things that we that somehow unlock our, our rigid ways of thinking and, and help us make new, new connections. So I'm talking in terms of ideals here. So if, if, I, if I wind back down round to this building, I mean, this is as constrained as it's possible to be. I mean, we're in the, in the middle of a very congested city. This is an existing building which we were, we were given to, to play with. And um, um, it's in a conservation area as well. Um, so it, uh, there were a lot of compromises had to be made. It was the I, I always likened the process to teaching an old lady to dance new steps. So I'd like to spend the last few minutes just, just going through a couple of those steps, basically to illuminate what I, um, what I was trying to grapple with earlier. Um, firstly, um, the space that you've all come through immediately above when you come through the front doors, that for me is the equivalent of that heart that I described you as, um, sitting around it. And I find it a wonderful correlation that, uh, that, that um, focus is, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe it's the Latin for heart. Um, so that, that's where you, the word has come from. There's, there's the, you know, the, if this is, is an expression of the soul of the building, the space immediately above us is what we, uh, where we try to get that soul to reside. Um, um, you then, so in terms of tricks, there's the um, suspended structure trick. You know, um, you're probably not even aware, but um, if we had just projected the structure of all the floors, of academic floors above, straight through to the basement, there would be two giant columns right in the middle of this main row. All the floors are suspended from a truss right on the top floor, which is what gives you the openness. And with that openness comes another aspect that maybe alludes to my dappled light through, through um, the, the forest canopy or different distances. The, the, the light is coming in from three directions. Well, it is if, 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 if the administrators keep the doors open, which is another <laughs> point. The, the outside steel doors were meant to be open when the building was in use. I've noticed only one of them is. Not no yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, And then there's the, I think it's a wonderful accident. Initially we were disappointed that the building seemed to be the wrong way around, that, that, that you, you very rarely get direct sunlight from the space. But it actually it's much more interesting because the architects of the, the building just behind us had the uh, foresight to put white glazed bricks um, on that little sort of um, light well elevation, which has now been exposed. So what the sun does is it tracks around. It, you, you get indirect light bouncing back in, which is, I think is much more intriguing uh, light quality. Um, then there's the TARDIS trick. I mean, actually, I, I remember Ricky, in, he was on the assessment panel when we won the project, and one of the things he had to go at us about is how closed our design was compared to uh, a couple of our competitors. Others had done radical things like taking the roof off or punching big holes through. As it turned out, um, dealing with the Camden and Conservation Department, we weren't conservative enough. <laughs> but um, I think it's also a happy accident. There's, the, the, there's a surprise element. You, you, you think this is an Edwardian building. You come in and, and you think, well, how, how, how is that such openness possible? Um, then there's the... Um, the continuum, I'll just call this a continuous surface trick. Um, you, you'll notice that there's this tim continuous timber surface which starts off as the floor around the lifts, cascades down what is effectively the ceiling over this lecture theatre, the thing reflecting, then turns up and forms the back wall. The timber is very important. The timber is giving that organic element, that warmth, that humanity. Uh, and, and then it also acts, we call it the sounding board, it's our kind of metaphor. Uh, and it acts as a containment device for um, a series of mezzanine levels. The mezzanine levels uh, are a vital part of the, uh, the way that the building encourages interactions in the, in the, the bottom four floors. Um, it's much easier to get eye contact with someone that's only a half level away than someone that's a full level away. It's, it, you can almost talk to them across, uh, across the gallery. I hope as people learn to use the building and as it needs a bit more furniture, I think, too. A few more places to sit down. The, the idea is we're, we're trying to encourage serendipitous interactions. But the estates to bond with the LSE would choose the furniture. Um, well, I think so we, we were involved so in some of the furniture, but I think it just needs more of it. 
Um, <laughs> um, so, and then lastly, I, I need, to, need to say something, something about the, the artwork. Um, nor, and we haven't been brave enough to do what uh, David Chipperfield has done with Anthony Gormley. We never actually sat down and, and collaborated from the start on a project. Uh, which is always the business, we've, we've almost designed the building, there's a competition, the clients involved again, so that's what we went through here. And I can say that we got this PDF of all the entries, and we were our team, uh, s several of you are actually here now, um, we, were, we, we were looking at the different proposals, and a cheer went up when we saw Joy Gerard's um, proposal, because she'd really taken our uh, sounding board metaphor and run with it. Um, sh so she calls this Elenchus Aporia, which is a very fancy Greek term. Elenchus meaning it's from the Socratic method of having a debate. Elenchus means uh, an opposing argument. Aporia is that state you reach when nothing is certain. Everything's been shaken by its roots, and there's a kind of state of perplexity. So what we've got is, is a kind of explosion, a chain reaction. There's, this, there's the mother idea, the, the large red sphere, surrounded by these silver, smaller balls, and, and then the progression continues around the back of the lips through the entire space. You've got a frozen moment of that point where everything's been exploded before it all comes back mm -hmm. together again. So, and actually, it harks back to some, uh, a, this is a phrase, a kind of motto we have in the office, and I believe it's attributed to David Hume, um, which is saying the same thing much more simply. Truth emerges from arguments among friends. I think what I'd like to go back later um, mm -hmm. to um, test you on something. You're often architects um, make assertions of what they think certain spaces will do. Yeah. Uh, and you describe the space above us uh, as performing certain functions. Which very, very interesting to hear what the analogies in your mind were. Uh, and I, I, I think that's you know, there's always something beyond the functional with which has to drive a space that is successful. Uh, I think it, I'd be interested to know, perhaps later, how, how do you measure in 20 years of uh, a career those spaces which have turned out to do what you want them to do? How informal a space, can a space in the middle of a building actually turn out to be when it has formal seating, say, mm -hmm. would be the, the questions which make you face one way rather than yep. face in different but I think that that's an interesting um, aspect which comes out of what you've been saying. Anthony, do, do you want to talk a, a little bit about some of the work you've done? And I know you're yeah. going to be showing also um, uh, some slides and a, a video. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nevin, that was really wonderful. I think it's wonderful um, in some senses to be sitting inside an object or a, a space that engages exactly with the subjects that we're talking about. Um, I just want to—I I want to show you a film of uh, the Chivik Pavilion that I made with David Shipfield last summer. But before I do, I just want to make a few general remarks. I think about—I think about where I feel um, art is going at the moment. And I think there there has been an extraordinary shift. <coughs> um, you could say—I mean, these are very broad strokes. That um, you know, for, for two thousand years of its history art was involved in making objects that were, in a way, representations of critical narratives, whether they were mythical, religious, or uh, political. The 20th century was uh, a time of self-reflection for art, um, in which it, it examined its own syntax, if you like. And I think we're now at a period where, in a, in, in a way, the freedoms that art claimed for itself um, in the 20th century, in which the artist became a kind of unique individual who was uh, able to determine the, the, the value of his own labor, or her own labor. I think we've got, we've got to a point where tho those freedoms that were claimed by modernity, by modernism, are now being offered back to the viewer. And it's not a question of interpreting iconography, but actually participating and what Duchamp called, uh, you know, uh, well he, he described the process as um, the viewer doing half of the work, and what Ernst Gombrich called the beholder's share, 
is I think the situation that we find ourselves in now uh, where in some sense a participatory collaboration between viewer and art object that actually is beginning to disintegrate from objectness to experience and using increasingly the idioms and uh, in a way structures of architecture in order to achieve that. So the, the title of our discussions today, uh, Spaces for Reflection, are incredibly pertinent uh, in terms of what I think of what I'm now experimenting with uh, uh, in, in, in my practice, because I think it's, it's part of a much bigger uh, movement, you could say not movement, because I think the time of isms is over. But if you think of what Olafur Eliasson is doing, what uh, James Turrell has been doing for years, and in a sense what the promise of a Carl andre floor was. What is a Carl andre floor? It's the, it's the, in a way, reduction of architectural space to its minimum. Simply the definition of a space by a flat plane made out of units onto which we are encouraged to walk, where the viewer becomes the viewed for other viewers, but more importantly becomes the reflexive subject of a field. Okay, having said that, I'd just like to show, can I, can I show the movies? I just, uh, ex excuse the heavy breathing, this is, this is a movie taken on a, on a mobile phone. Uh, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> Uh, but it'll just give you a, a bit of a bit of uh, a background to the. I think we'll have to have the lights off, otherwise we won't be able to see it. Can we get rid of the? Um oh no, no, no! I mean the side bit. Well, never mind. It's uh, fine. What about a bit more heavy green? <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Never mind. Um, the the piece is called. Um, a sculpture for the subjective experience of architecture. It exists on a mound on the southeast corner of southern Sweden in a place called Chibi. There's a bit of sound, isn't there? Um, you should be able to hear the birds singing. It's made out of 600 tons of concrete. Did I tell you what, this, what, what the title was? A Sculpture for the Subjective Experience of Architecture. It's three spaces that are all 100 cubic meters, but they've been stretched in, to different conformations. The first is a, more or less a cube and is more or less solid and we're going in through a doorway. The space is dark. It's like a tomb. Well, you can see it's very dark. <coughs> and you go up a staircase which conforms to the 250 millimeter bands that are the structural uh, and, in fact, um, yeah, um, the constructional logic of the piece. And you're then exposed on a second volume where there are two doors, uh, two walls missing entirely. And you're about five meters from the ground. So it's relatively dangerous. Um, at that point you're also within the forest. This is an oak forest of about 300 years of, uh, of age. Um, and you can't see very far through the trees. You see here that there, there is no mortar between these bands of 250 miles. And you can see down here now uh, to, the, to the staircase where, where, where uh, we made access to the, what I call the stage. Um, we're then going up the third element, which is the tower, which also has uh, 
stairs, 200, everything is 250, which is obviously that much higher than the standard riser on the stair. So you're made even more physically aware of this act of going up, which you're made even more aware of in the fact that it's very, very dark again. And there are these tiny eye holes that are simply 30 millimeters square as you go up. And this is a bit like, for me, a glimpse of the eye. In a way, it's a kind of burst of light when you're going up. I really like the quality of these things because they're sort of crude. But the idea is that all of these spaces, these things, we had to, because of the danger involved in going into the space, allow people only in one or two of the rooms. And the idea is that there is no function of this building other than the experience of being in it. And when you get up to the top, you are released into daylight and released into a view. You can see a view of 360 degrees to the horizon and to the sea. You're now above the forest. And you've got an absolutely free view. OK, I think that will do. As you can see, I'm not ever going to make it as a floor painter. But I just wanted to show you the... Let's try a full screen. I'd like to just see the building from the outside because that was... Yeah, very good. So there's the building or the sculpture. I think it's very important that it exists between those two states. The extraordinary thing is that we managed to build it in two months. It's unwatered? It's entirely unwatered, yeah. I mean, basically, it's clamped together with... The weight of the masonry. With steel. Yeah, it's quite... I mean, the two cantilevers are quite extreme. And they weigh 22 tons each. And if you stand on this bottom corner, the projecting bottom corner, and you jump up and down, the whole thing shakes in the most alarming way. Anyway, the reason that I wanted to show you this is that I think that this is quintessentially a, in a way, space for reflexivity, for the subject to begin to experience their own being in space as the subject of whatever it is, the art. And I'm very interested in that, obviously, in relation to this. This is the plinth that was built in the mid-19th century for William IV, the son of George IV. Nobody liked him enough to pay for the equestrian statue that was supposed originally to go on top of it. And when they asked me to contribute to the fourth plinth project, I mean, to put in a proposal, I had this idea. I kept kind of backing it away. Why not just allow real people to occupy it? And that's what we announced on Thursday, that, well, I hope all of you will apply to stand on it. You get an hour each. It's a real contract. You have to spend your hour. You can't say after 10 minutes, I'm bored, let me out of here. You've got to stay up there. But I just wanted to show you this to give you an indication of how it's going to be modified. Obviously, in a present day of health and safety, we're going to have to put some kind of a safety net around it, which changes the nature of this 19th century bit of civic pomp into something hopefully both more playful but also more sinister. It has the combined effect of a basketball net 
uh, and a concentration camp fence. Um, and on the, on the stanchions on the four corners will be a pickup mic, a very, very bright LED light, and a high-definition camera that has uh, a 360 rotation that, that can be radio controlled. So every smallest gesture of yours or slight flicker of fear or joy on your lips will be transmitted to the world via the, web, the website. Um, this is going to be streamed live with about a seven-second seven delay uh, to oneandother.co.uk. Uh, remember that, oneandother.co.uk, which is the site. Uh, I'm expecting you all to apply. Uh, but applications aren't until the 6th of, of, uh, of April, but you can just go and have a look. There's another, there's another little film, bad film of me uh, telling you about it. Um, but the, the, the idea here is everybody thinks of this as, oh, well, this is just a cheap one of these David Blaine thing that's kind of, you know, been turned populist and he's calling it art and, you know, this is just typical um, of a self-promoting um, contemporary artist like you. Um, <laughs> But I, I, my contention is that the real, the real purpose and the real subject of this project, which is an experience, not an object, and is called one and other, is what happens to the subject when removed from the street and placed in the idealized space of art. And what does he or her learn about themselves when abstracted, as it were, from the collective? And what do they learn about the world and the objects in it from this space of removal, isolation, and vision? Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I mean, it is very much sort of inverting the role of the, um, the artist uh, sorry, the, the 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 viewer and the viewer. I mean, it, it's it's the world as seen from the point of view of art. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a very well. Is it? Is it? Is it? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, um, I want to say just about uh, this project that we're hoping that the LSE can uh, participate in this in some uh, active way. Uh, uh, the, uh, which we're going to try and work out. Uh, it's an amazing project. Actually, I'll talk some more about it at the end. I thought what might be useful um, to do is to talk today a little about um, the public space for reflection. Um, what does it mean to be in public, in a public space, and become reflective? And this is an issue that struck me because it's a great dilemma in modern cities. Uh, it's become very difficult to imagine what those spaces were like, which should be like. Space where, by being in public in the presence of other people, you become more reflective. And, um, and it's a very, I think, very urgent problem. And to try and set it up, I'd like to make a kind of then and now contrast to time at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, when it wasn't such a problem, when people took it more for granted that when you wanted to think about things, you know, really reflect, uh, you went outside and you uh, uh, were in a public space. And I'll talk about two of these spaces for you. They're very interesting. One is a cafe, Continental Cafe, and the other is the library. Now, the cafe uh, is a, a, co a coffee house uh, originally, uh, derived from material change, that is the appearance of coffee in the 16th century as a European drink. Uh, it was a drink first uh, consumed by Jews in the Venetian ghetto because uh, they used it to stay awake at night to, uh, in order to study the Torah. And they were the first consumers of coffee. This was quite a, a nocturnal people, I suppose, in that, in that sense. Uh, 
But by the 18th century, the coffee house and even more the cafe had developed as a very peculiar kind of institution. Part of what made it peculiar was that it coincided with the advent of the mass-produced newspaper. Uh, and if any of you are readers of Jürgen Habermas, you know from his book on the transformation of the structural realm that the advent of the mass newspaper was a revolution, social revolution in Europe. It meant that information was available to everybody instantly and cheaply. And those newspapers were mostly read in cafes rather than by individual subscription. You still know it if you know any Central European uh, cafe. You know the newspaper that's on its little rack and anybody uh, can go uh, read it. The interesting thing about the creation of this space for information and reflection was that it was conceived of entirely in terms of solitude. That is to say that when you were in public reading your newspaper, you were not to be disturbed. It's a kind of anthropological convention which grows up in the 18th century. The moment you close the newspaper, somebody at a neighboring table can ask you about it. But the moment you're actually seen reading, you're in public, but you're in isolation. You have a right to the silence necessary for reflection. Um, so that there's a kind of code, uh, all sorts of anthropological things about this are quite interesting. I don't know if you've ever reflected why, when you go into a French cafe, the tables are so small. The reason they're so small is that they're designed for single people. That is, that somebody would get out of the houses, the houses are mostly freezing cold in any, any event, the cafe is nice and warm. But the notion is that you had your table, the table at which you read, maybe you wrote, but that the table size inhibited other people uh, from interacting with you. So this is a space of thought in which the notion of being in public is being given the freedom of solitude in a way. And in that way, you're in these cafes, you're, 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 your capacity to think becomes something where you're in the, in, is, is silence in public is the key to this space of thought. However, the, the idea of the cafe is also one of compression. That's the second aspect of it. That is, that you don't want to be at a table that's far from someone else. And with the advent of plate glass, which begins 1784, the effect of plate glass, the cafes are the first institutions that put huge window walls of, of plate glass enclosed in kind of iron brace so that people can look out. It's for the first time in cafes that people sit outside in the summer, something we take absolutely for granted. But in the smelly and uh, insalubrious conditions of an 18th century city, there had to be a motivation that would get you close to the horseshit, human manure, etc., that littered the street. And that was the notion of being able to observe, to be in public, be an observer, of this passing street scene, and yet be withdrawn in this kind of liminal space that is established by the small table that you also read in your newspaper. So it's a spectator space and a reflective space at the same time. Uh, and it took no architectural genius to do this. It took a kind of social genius, but not an architectural genius. And some of that logic, however, is then brought into the creation of public libraries in the 19th century. These are architectural institutions that in some, to me, very significant ways draw on the, if you like, the, the sociology of the cafe. Uh, 
the idea of a library, and again, this may seem absolutely striking to you, uh, uh, unstriking to you, but was striking, was that you'd mass a crowd of people together who were reading in a reading room. Reading room was a great invention of the late 19th, early 20th century. And of course, the greatest reading room we had in London in the British Library until, and it remained so, the, is it Smirk? Mm -hmm. design. Remained so until Norman Foster got his hands on it. I don't want to speak about uh, <laughs> that. Uh, but the notion was that you had people compressed together in a space of silence to reflect. But the, the, the thing about the library is that it also transforms the logic of the cafe in terms of class. Because the library is a place in which serious reflection now occurs by mixing classes together. That is, there's no <coughs> distinction between the old British library and the great continental libraries like the Bibliothèque Nationale between your one social class and another. You could have a very elegant lady sitting next to um, a woman who was a seamstress, who were both had a reader's ticket. And this was an extraordinary innovation. It meant in class terms that these spaces for thought were spaces in which social class was compressed, that people were adjacent to each other from different classes, whereas the whole logic of capitalism was to send apart like a kind of negative charge to send people who are unlike apart. Um, what made it safe again was the rule of silence that that very elegant bourgeois lady and the seamstress never had uh, to sp speak to other. God forbid she should speak to a seamstress. But it went the other way around as well. And I recommend to you a wonderful book whose author has just gone out of my mind, but the title is stretched in my mind, called The Intellectual Life of the British Working Classes. It'll come to me probably about 12 o'clock tonight, the name of this author. Uh, which is about the experience of a space for reflection and thought for working class people who were afraid of people who were richer than themselves, who felt uncomfortable in their presence. You know, who felt ill at ease that they didn't belong next to a bourgeois. And these spaces made it possible to compress their physical presence together and ensure that they had a right, as it were, to be at the table. The table they had to be at a right to was not a space of verbal interaction, but of silence. So, you know, when I think about those, that kind of public realm, very different from the way Habermas thought about a public realm, where he thought about it as active spaces of speech with each other. These are spaces of togetherness, but in silence. That this was a great cultural creation in the past. And it served as a kind of backdrop in my own mind for thinking about why is it so difficult today to create a public realm and public spaces in which some of those same qualities are present, in which being in a crowd <coughs> encourages you to think, to reflect, in which people who come from different ethnicities, different backgrounds, can be compressed together. Um, it takes an enormous amount of effort to imagine a space in which people who are different are comfortable together. You know? It's one of the most difficult things in the practice of social architecture. And we usually avoid that by thinking about public space as a space of consumption, action, people doing things in the same place but not related to each other. So, you know, the issue that you've posed is 
is a very, to me, a very arousing one, because it really has to do, I've sometimes thought about this, that silence is a greater, in the presence of other people, is a greater guarantee of democracy than speech. You know? It is a greater guarantee that you can be with someone else and be silent together. It is more democratic than all this Habermas and little arguments. So we don't want to get into that either. And it's why when I think about your project, which I think about as our project, something of what I see in that physical space, that it's a space raised up and it's isolated, is almost a metaphor for the problem of, spa of spaces for thought. It's taking people away, above, the reflection they do, like St. Stilites, mm. could be silent. Uh, the communication is uh, uh, kind of Foucauldian surveillance. Their every noise, their every gesture is recorded. They're being looked at. Is it a space for reflection in that sense? Is it a model? I'm not challenging you. I'm mm. asking you a question. No, I think for me, okay. I think for me, uh, the tension between, if you like, the, the subjective experience of the subject and the, the, in a way, the degree to which that becomes public uh, is what makes this interesting. Absolutely. And I think, you know, um, of course there will be uh, people who want to do party tricks up there. But I think I'm... The I'm most somebody who is just silent. Well, I, th I think that that's what will reveal the most personally, but uh, I think that even the best, the best in a way, planned uh, party trick um, will have to be uh, modified by the fact that you're 25 feet above the ground <laughs> and, uh, and you've, got yeah. a, you've got very limited space. It's, it's, it's about just under six foot wide and uh, about uh, 14 foot long. Um, and I, I, I mean, it is a, it, it, it's an entirely open question uh, how people will react. Uh, I, I remember that when I was placed, I, I, I had myself lifted by a crane and put on a column. Um, I'd made a sculpture that, where I tried to, I tried to think about. I mean, it, w when you see Nelson, he's very happy up there. Uh, but actually. Uh, I tried it out for myself and, and I couldn't stop my knees knocking honestly it was absolutely terrifying, terrifying. I, I, I looked down and I, and, I, and I knew that I was going to fall so I had to concentrate on the horizon in order to stay uh, this, was, this was 45 feet from the ground the plinth is much bigger so the idea of examining uh, you know, for those of us who are not having the experience the idea of examining um, yes there is a de high degree of cruelty uh, involved in this, there is a there is the there is a sense of the Tyburn uh, situation, yeah. but at the same time, I think it's very important that uh, for for the for the for the subject, this abstraction from the life flow. I I hope that it will be a moment of, in a way, extreme reflection. Um, because but it is an abstraction. I mean, it is just an abstraction right. from life in, in a well, literal, but also... A now the social scientist in me speaks to you. I mean, ma maybe one of the things to do is make this one stage in a process where people then come down and there's more of it is about what they, how they react to it when, when they're, as it were, on the ground. And yeah, so well, we're going to talk to them, them afterwards and, and say, how was it for you? <laughs> this will be done with a lot of vodka. <laughs> well, just to just to finish what I was saying to you about this, I I um, I think this whole issue of of quiet and calm in public is a deeply loaded subject, and I um, uh, I think it's a kind of gift that we as urban designers have to learn how to make to you. Because 
when we talk about live and dead public space, this is the last thing I want to say about this, we mostly are thinking about action. Right? A live public space, things, lots of things happening, you know, skateboarders in the South Bank and so on. Uh, and that's true. That is one dimension of this. But something that may be more of more lasting value would be the equivalent of reinventing the cafe in the 21st century, a place where people can be in the presence of others and think about themselves. And I think, Richard, one of, one of the key points you're raising that connects to the point I was making to you earlier is that ultimately um, the act of actually making space, whether it's inside an institution, right. as basic as you, the, the unit of the cafe, very interesting point you make about the invention of plate glass and what effect that has on the relationship mm. between the inside and the outside and between people. Ultimately, the, what, one, of, one of the biggest difficulties uh, in the production of space production of an installation is to, which by definition design is yeah. um, something which tries to fix something, and fix it in space, right. produce limits, is to induce and enhance a degree of randomness. I mean, in a way, that, that's, that's, that's the sort of predicament, that's the polarity, that ultimately we have to design things, we have to make things, we have to um, define spaces, keep the rain out, etc keep the sound, right. uh, but what in a way you're calling for, um, and that's why I want to come back to you now, uh, is spaces which then allow many things which were never in the intention of the designer to actually allow to happen. I mean, I, I just want to uh, speculate with you, uh, many of us, or many of you here may or may not remember that um, in the mid-1990s, the London School of Economics, which is, you know, with the exception of this building, the most Dickensian, uh, difficult series of corridors and cellular offices with tiny little departments, uh, which are very happy to be at the end of dark corridors so that no one else can come anywhere near them. This great institution was going to move to what was then the GLC, the Greater London Council, which is, as I remember rightly, has the longest corridor in Europe with rooms <laughs> off it. So could you imagine what would happen to the relationships between lawyers, economists, and sociologists, um, what would have happened to the development of, yeah. of uh, uh, to uh, the interactions between those disciplines? I think probably uh, the school and the people in the school and the type of knowledge produced would have been very, very different had we moved there 20 years ago than uh, where we are now, that we've kept at this relatively labyrinthine, we use that word before. <coughs> but Nevin, how, how do you I mean, try as an architect, measure uh, <coughs> success in terms of creating some of those slightly intangible things that Richard is talking about, but which we all understand, and that we all think, where on earth can I go to a space which was created in the last 20 years, which has the quality of a 19th century French uh, or Itali uh, Italian plaza? I mean, um, the first thing I'd say is, can't impress on you how difficult it is as an architect to let go, because um, you, you, know, you, have, um, you have two intense years um, where you're completely obsessed about this. <laughs> so sometimes uh, my daughter comes home and asks me, you know, "What did you do today, Dad?" You know, and I explain, and you know, that, you know, I've been thinking about you know this series of walls and, and exactly where. She said, "That's so boring. You've just been thinking about that all day." <laughs> um, you should hear what Anthony's kids yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> he just means it's generic, and don't worry about it. It's all right. <laughs> so letting go is um, I w um, really we, we sh architects should think of our buildings as children. Actually, continuing that metaphor, because basically you, you bring them up. And you try and think of all the eventualities, but then you've got to, you know, they've got to, got to go out there, and they make their own way in the world. And you hope that you get endowed these rooms, facades, whatever it is, with sufficient foresight and training, so that they will, you know, they will contend with whatever whatever they come up with on their own. 
and you know it's not yours anymore. It takes about it takes about a year and a half for the sort of to wear off and you get you know, a, a sort of a sane level of kind of detachment. Mm. Because sometimes, and if you don't, it's very painful. I mean, there's some of our buildings I drive past and think, God, um, you know, I wish someone would look after that kid. You know, <laughs> give it a good scrub down. Um, Anthony, in the same vein, how, I mean, with, with the projects you've done, I'm thinking of Crosby, I'm thinking of Field, uh, or, or the interventions in the London skyline uh, in the exhibition surrounding the, the Hayward. How are you able to sort of measure whether things work in, in relation to you, you, what you expected, what you predicted, and where things were completely out of sync with what you imagined, and, and therefore I'm thinking ahead to the fourth plan. Well, I'm thinking I'm I'm thinking that the obvious place that answers this uh, need for uh, being together uh, in silence is is an art gallery, and the fact that uh, now interesting. The battle, the great battle between the British Museum and Tate Modern, um, British Museum is just ahead by about 500,000, um, but they're getting uh, about six million, and Tate Modern mm. is getting about four, four and a half. And it's very clear that we do need these spaces. We do need these places uh, that are open to, as it were, all ethnicities, all language groups, and all classes where through the silent contemplation of objects that have come often from deep history, communication exists, well, in an extraordinary, extraordinary way. I think that we have to put all of this in the, in, in, in the context, I think, of a, of a, of a world that where more and more of us are spending more and more time in front of screens. The engagement with objects that speak to us in tactile, visual, uh, and I think bodily ways is, is becoming more and more important. And I have to just say, I mean, you know, my m more and more of the things that I'm doing are dealing with this idea of non-verbal. I'm, I'm, I'm really taken with this idea of si silence as, in a way, the medium, the, me the necessary medium of another form of togetherness. So I'm about to embark next month on a project called Clay and the Collective Body, hmm. which will be a 200-ton cube of clay, which will be about four meters by four meters by four meters inside an inflatable uh, building of about 2,000 square feet, uh, 2,000 2, square meters, sorry, it's, it's quite a lot, 36 by 36, maybe my maths isn't very good. In that, in that building that will have no windows, it's a double-skinned um, inflated pneumatic building um, with about seven, 700 lux uh, will be an atmosphere of 95 degree humidity. Uh, the cube will be exposed. People will be allowed to touch it, but only touch it uh, and look at it for four days. And then for 10 days, between 100 and 200 people a day uh, having committed themselves to four hours, uh, will be allowed to transform that cube. Um, I've done a pilot project uh, over two and a half days, and it's absolutely extraordinary how silence is the medium through which this emergent collective community of interest that is engaging in this material, in a way, uh, confrontation uh, exists. And it, the, obviously we're starting from a point of view of, in a way, materialism, of, of, in a way, a Richard Serra confrontation with a base material. But I'm interested in the social dimension of art. I'm not interested in the formal uh, for its own sake. And this, this transformation of the absolute, you could say it refers to Malevich's black square, to the kind of, to the, to the, to that uh, incredible moment at the beginning of the 20th century of, of kind of absolutism in terms of, of art practice that is now being confronted by the social dimension of space, you could say. So, so this is a project that puts mass, 
in space and then contest it with the energy that is, that is carried by a collective body. And um, anyway, I mean, uh, I'm really interested also in the transformation of the museum. We have the British Museum, we have the Tate Modern. What is the distinction? The distinction is the museum is no longer, as it were, simply the treasure house of objects of known provenance that have a label or whatever. They have become production houses. They have become places of mutual testing of what it means to make culture. And making culture is not only an engagement, I think, with, with, as it were, what things are, but also what things can be. And that, that I mean, that goes back to this participatory. But Richard, would, would you take the tendency of the, uh, the Tate, with, with, with all its positive attributes, which of course many of us share, as perhaps going uh, not necessarily in the direction of the sort of um, reflective spaces that you were talking about in the 19th century French Library. Do you, does that worry you, the trend of the museum? No, not at all. No, I mean, I think this is very, tr is very true. I think one of the reasons that people migrate into such large numbers to museums is to be in that peculiar condition of being in the presence of other people, contemplating an object, uh, and uh, not being verbally forced in, in, into interact, interaction. I mean, they are our public squares, museums. And um, it's amazing to me, for instance, the British Museum, nothing trendy about, about sixth century pots. Huh? Uh, it's not the art market. And those rooms are filled with people who ha are in a state of Sus literally suspended Suspense. animation. You know, the whole problem with this is a kind of, it's a mistake in, in social theory that then became elaborated into new labor, a kind of new labor cliche, which is the notion that when we have a social group, we have a group which is necessarily uh, uh, in which people represent themselves to each other. Right? So the new labor version of this kind of mutual representation, this kind of Habermasian view of the public, was that if you had Asians and uh, Brits and Portuguese uh, together at a community meeting, each should speak in the name of who they are. And the, the tyranny of that is that you must speak in the name of who you are. So an institution like a museum lets go of that, you know, because that kind of verbal impulse to say who you are, what you're interested in, and so on. Good, and it's also that these are not spaces which are self-created. Again, you know, we think that a lot of the cultural institutions uh, ought to be things that are generated by their users. Well, that's true of some. It's true of workplaces, certainly. Uh, that the people who do the work ought to be the ones who organize the work. But other kinds of experience in the public realm should release us from having to be authors of what we think about, what we do. You know, we have very, uh, what I'm trying to convey to all of you is this is a very one-dimensional notion of being in public, mm -hmm. which is a realm of communicative interaction through words. It's very one-dimensional. And the reason, I think that architecture and sculpture, of the, so I, wouldn't, I don't know if I'd call you a sculpture. I don't know what I'd call you. Sure, I'm right, man. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason that this kind of art making matters is that it adds something for people to reflect about. They're not, they don't have to be the authors of their own uh, mental world. It's a great gift. Let's use uh, this space at the moment for conversation, for you comments. I mean? Now, do we have a microphone? Mm -hmm. Just going around? How does it work? Okay. No, the others need to hear you, though. Can you pass? Gormley, 
church is the view of the Zionists. No, no, that's not the point. That's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. Um, hmm. the, um, I, I think I touched on, I mean, when I used the word sublime in my little piece at the beginning, I was alluding to, I think, what you're alluding to as well. Um, um, so, <coughs> the very, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try another way into this. For ex let me look at it this way. It's, it's actually, where there's a project that we've got on the go, and we had a, we're having a big debate about this last week. Um, to imagine an atrium inside a workplace which can just be a light well. Um, there's, um, for me, the sacred dimension, the sublime dimension, is being aware, being sensitive to the fact that um, you need to somehow negotiate in your mind a way out of it. I personally loathe atria that are enclosed on four sides. There has to be a gap. The, the um, another analogy was that actually came up in that particular conversation. If you think of St. Mark's Square, which is largely an enclosed space, very large enclosed space, we all actually have in our mind the construct that there's that, you know, you go past, you, uh, you go past the basilica and you know that there's that way out in its corner, even though you can't actually see it from where you are. Um, these, I think... Um, Things like this go back to, uh, as I was saying, the way we're wired as individuals uh, to feel comfortable. And um, I suppose that would, you know, th that, that would be my response if you're keeping religion out of it. Okay. I, think, I, mean, I think that um, the Chivik Pavilion, for me, um, is a sacred space. I mean, uh, the, I'm, I'm worried about, in a sense, the um, enforced notion of uh, spirituality. So far as I'm concerned, the relationship between proprioception, one's awareness of experience of uh, a time-space dimension as a physical thing, and then uh, the world at large, the, the, the relationship between, you could say that those three spaces start with the tomb, you then have this stage in which you are exposed. You then have this um, experience of going up through a dark, rising chamber to be then exposed to the horizon. And as far as I'm concerned, the horizon, you know, we have, we have minds that live in bodies that are bounded by a skin. The bodies live in architecture that are bounded by walls. We then have a perceptual boundary that is the horizon. And I think what the human imagination is capable of is thinking about what lies beyond the horizon. So for me, the, the Chivik Pavilion, it has no function. It is a useless building. Mm. However, uh, the, it contains or it is the instrument for a certain kind of experience that mediates between an exposure to the horizon uh, and an exposure to your bodily sensations as you walk around these very enclosed, partially exposed, and then perceptually exposed spaces. And so, so far as I'm concerned, you know that um, this is a, I, I, I guess, a a building that acts out three of the basic meditations in Theravadan Buddhism, uh, the seating meditation, the walking meditation, and the looking meditation. Um, and in, some, in, th in that respect, this pavilion is actually an instrument of reflexivity. Richard, we, you and I were talking earlier that you've just uh, come back from seeing um, the restored uh, Noise Museum in Berlin, a building which was savagely 
affected by not only bombing but by um, the uh, sad and wounded history of Berlin over the last uh, 60 years. And perhaps what you were recounting to me as an experience of being in there touches on very, very similar issues, just confrontation with pain and history uh, through a very sensitive architectural device. This is a building uh, which for the last 10 years had been slowly restored. Imagine the British Museum bombed uh, and what you do with it. Uh, it's a process of 10 years where an architect, David Chipperfield, the same one who in fact designed the pavilion that um, uh, Anthony has just shown us, has been painstakingly working on restoring it both as a gallery but as a place of memory. And perhaps you might want to comment on that. Uh, yes, I mean, it's a change of subject. It's a different kind of space for thought that he's tried to, uh, to deal with. This building bombed twice, once in 43, once in 45, as Ricky says, was uh, neglected for 40 years. Uh, it's columns uh, in the courtyard and so on. When they decided, the, the city fathers, that they were going to um, uh, do something about the building, they had three choices. One of them would be to restore the building to the way it was before the Second World War, in all its pristine imperial glory. Uh, the second was simply to raise it flat and make a new building, not try and conserve anything that was there. Uh, the third was to somehow register the history of the lived experience of the building uh, in the restoration so that people had to think about what had happened to this building over time as a process. And uh, David uh, Chipperfield chose the third way of dealing with the building to make people think about, not just about the war, but about the kinds of uh, uh, issues of uh, uh, collapse and regeneration, of things wearing out and being restored, the time of, of any object. This was a traumatic time. So what he's done in the building, for instance, is the, some things that are very obvious, very old parts of the building have been incorporated into new structures where the where the ceilings and the walls have collapsed. But he's also been rather clever because he's restored the damage as well. That I was in one room where um, he's actually put back some of the way the walls looked in 1945 so that you see all the stains mm -hmm. and the bullet holes. This was also a site where the Russians, when they got into Berlin, were trying to machine gun any German that, that, that uh, raised his or her head. So some of the bullet holes, these are not old bullet holes, they're new Chipperfieldian bullet holes. Uh, there, there are signs of damage, uh, are restored to make you think about how the building was lived in. There are non-traumatic ways in which the building also is a space for thought. This was the, the Germans in the, in the 1840s, when this building was conceived, were mad for ancient Egypt. This was the height of that orientalist passion that Edward Said writes about. And this building was filled with oriental uh, objects and decorated in an oriental, uh, in an Egyptian, Egyptian style. In the 20s, a Bauhaus architect got his paws on the rooms in which this, uh, this Egyptian stuff was housed and made white box cubes inside, uh, the, uh, inside this 19th century Orientalist fantasy. So what Chipperfield has done is he's in some rooms left a bit of the cube and a bit of what was there before. And it makes you really think about the whole story of Orientalism itself, right? It's a movement from being very imperialist, it's not. Now that's a different way of making a space for thought. It's by registering the passage of time and uh, 
the presence of trauma in adult environment. I don't know if we've been so good about that in Britain. I mean, where would you go in London to really register how people lived through the Second World War? I, I, I don't know the city well enough. That, that's the Imperial War Museum. Yeah, let's go, try and get a that's few more. That's not the only place you've got. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, but for different reasons, not to see that. Uh, two questions, over yeah. there and over there. Yeah. yeah hi, um, it's a question for Anthony, really. Yeah. I, mean, um, I was interested when you were showing the pavilion, the kind of element of, I mean, danger yeah. and violence and precariousness, yeah. and it seemed to kind of, I mean, it made me think about Space Station, which was also at the exhibition at the Haywood, yeah. and the way you kind of, I don't know, the way that it evokes nausea almost as you're kind of engaging with yourself with these <coughs> internalities and externalities. And I was wondering um, what your progression of thought was between the two, given that Space Station was, I mean, I don't know, 20 years ago that you made that? Um, and are, you, you are you talking about allotment or Space Station, the, 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 the big steel piece? Space in Stations, yeah, it's made out of kind of 10 mil steel. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, 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 I, I only made that last summer. Oh, really? Yeah, brand well, new. I mean, I mean, really, brand new. I mean, really, the thing is what about the danger. I mean, the, the kind of precariousness of it, the huge cantilevers, and that kind of feeling, and why you feel that it's necessary to um, to create those kind of emotions in order for people to engage in a reflexive space. Well, Burke said it, didn't he? There is no beauty without some terror in it. Uh, and we've dealt with the sublime. And I think the the issue for me is how, how in, in, in a time of post-modernity, and I'm not saying that, uh, that I'm a post-modernist, I'm, I'm talking about the point that we... Are, have arrived at where modernity itself is an archaeological construct. How do we how, how do we deal with that as a reality? I mean, my main I think my my main thought um, is that what happens to the human imagination when we live within orthogonal architecture, and when that is made in a way absolute by by the building constructions that that, that we have become in a way. Um, Anthony, imprisoned in. Last question. Yeah, um, I, I teach in both uh, philosophy and art practice, and it's, it's really just, it's, it's sort of too easy, too, too tempting to um, a waffle or, or language on these issues to go on sort of holiday, <coughs> if one might borrow uh, Wittgenstein's phrase. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, there has been no mention of the I word or the P word. Uh, why? By, by that I mean ideology uh, and positivism. Uh, is, is the assumption that um, our experience, appearances, art, so called, speak for themselves, are unmediated by beliefs, uh, values, and assumptions, or worldview? Um, and also, Thank you for that. I mean, obviously, this is the beginning of another seven-hour <laughs> <laughs> panel, um, and I'm going to ask Richard to answer it in 30 seconds. But it is a literary weekend for once at the LSE. I think all those uh, words with the I and the P and the E uh, are talked about in this institution every day uh, at great length, and I'm sure that a lot of the, of the intellectual practice by uh, the three people involved uh, in this panel engage with that. I mean, we have purposely, in a way, uh, stayed away from that also because of the nature uh, of um, uh, speculation on the creative process as opposed to dealing with some of the big issues you dealt with. But, Richard, do you want to explain? I don't. Okay. <laughs> but thank you for an interesting question, which we can't answer here. <laughs> it's, it's one o'clock. Thank you to the three speakers, and thank you to you for being such a good...
Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think we should.